Those are the biggies. Then every once in a while, you get these interesting things that happen. West Nile virus is a virus that's mosquito-borne. It has been in the Middle East and in Africa for centuries. One day, somebody or something got on a plane. It was a person who was infected, a mosquito that got into the hold, or a bird, since birds are carriers, landed at Kennedy Airport. The first cases were in Long Island. I remember that time I, I was on CNN and, 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 and the networks practically every night. What does this mean? Do you think we're going to have a West Nile virus uh, taking hold in this country? And the answer was, duh, of course. We have people, we have mosquitoes, and we have the virus. So there's no way it's going to disappear. And as a matter of fact, in the blue bars of the number of cases of West Nile up to last year, it's become endemic. It's really here to stay. Thank goodness it is at a very low smoldering level. Dengue. Now, this is another disease that people just don't pay any attention to. If you look at the map, the red zones across the globe are the areas where dengue is predominant and prevalent. 2.5 billion people are at risk. There are about 2.5 million infections each year. Now, something interesting, because dengue is a perfect example of a re-emerging infection. So let me go through the slide with you. If you look from 1955 through 2007, the red circles are the number of countries in which dengue cases have been reported, and the blue bars are the number of cases that have been reported. So smoldering along there, though not very many people who live in New York City worry about dengue, it's trickling along. So two years ago, two and a half years ago, I wrote a commentary in the Journal of the American Medical Association which unfortunately was prescient because I said, dengue and hemorrhagic fever is a potential threat to the public health in the United States. Why? Because you have dengue in Brazil, you have dengue in the Caribbean, you have mosquitoes, the same kind of mosquitoes that are in the Caribbean are in Florida. I said, we really need to be careful about that. Sure enough, there were 28 cases of locally acquired dengue in Key West and then later in Dade County. So that doesn't mean you have to go home and worry about dengue, but dengue is a disease that's kind of lapping at our shores. Now, here's one that we're living with today, and that is cholera. Cholera had essentially never been seen in Haiti before. I, I, I Literally, as I got on the Amtrak, my office called me up and said, the numbers are wrong. There are now 6,000 cases and 4, 400 deaths but it is a real problem. So cholera is a disease that is intimately linked to sanitation. It's a disease of poverty. It's a disease of underdevelopment. You're not gonna get Haiti if you have good sanitation. Excuse me, you're not gonna get cholera if you have good sanitation. So if you look at some key facts, acute diarrheal disease that can actually kill you within hours. If you have good medical facilities and you rehydrate someone, it's 100% curable. So the double whammy of the developing world is the pure, the, 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 the terrible sanitary conditions which allows cholera to take place and the lack of access to health care, which doesn't allow people who have cholera to get rehydrated. And that's exactly what's going on right now in Haiti, and I'd be happy to talk about that as we discuss it. I want to close on um, one, again, that seems to be around all the time, influenza. Influenza is interesting. It's a double whammy. Influenza is a re-emerging disease every year. We get a little bit of a change in influenza, which requires our getting revaccinated, And then every once in a while, a big one comes along, and we get a brand new influenza, which we call a pandemic. So you break that down into what we call seasonal, which is predictable. Every winter, guaranteed, there will be seasonal influenza depending upon when your winter is. If you're in the northern hemisphere, your winter is going to be from December through March. If you're in the southern hemisphere, it's in the middle of the summer. But it happens predictably. Pandemic is when the virus changes so much that it's unpredictable and there's no residual 
a protection in the population. The trouble with our society is that we don't take seasonal influenza very seriously. About a half a million deaths a year globally, and anywhere from three to 49,000 deaths in the United States, an average of about 36,000, and tens of billions of dollars in economic costs. Pandemic influenza, everybody's afraid of a repeat of 1918, where about 30% of the world's population fell ill and 50 million deaths occurred in one year. Can you imagine what that is? 50 million deaths in one year from an emerging virus. And that's the reason why everyone was very concerned when this new H1N1 pandemic, the so-called swine flu, came around. And in fact, this is a USA Today from June of 2009 when the WHO declared the first flu pandemic in 41 years. Fortunately for us, it was relatively mild even though there were 61 million infections in the United States, there were relatively few deaths, 12,000 compared to an average of 36,000. The difficulty is it selectively infected children, and there were more deaths among children from pandemic flu a year and a half ago than we've ever seen in seasonal flu. So the totality was a mild flu, but if you were a child, it was a serious disease. So uh, the, the solution to this is to just think of it all as one. Just keep preparing as best as you can for seasonal flu, and when pandemic flu comes along, you will be better prepared. So I'm gonna close with a couple of slides uh, to tie the knot and come full circle about the importance of a global health strategy. President Obama is, is committed to this. Um, he has been very explicit uh, about our need to continue our global health strategy. And he actually credits in the quote in a speech he gave in Ghana last July, a year ago last July, building on the strong efforts of President Bush will carry forward the fight against HIV and will pursue the goal of ending deaths from malaria, tuberculosis, and will work to eradicate polio. And for those of you who are familiar with that, he's come out what's called a global health initiative that's being run out of USAID. Uh, it's a, um, a, a very impressive program that's incorporated the, PEP, the, the PEPFAR program. And these are the target areas of his global health initiative. And Hillary Clinton has also been playing a major role in this since, as you know, USAID is, na is now under the State Department. And if you look at that list of the target areas these are the ones that we've been speaking about, among others. So global health is on the map for us. It's important because we live in a global society. But whenever I say that, I really would, and, and I actually wrote about it just a, a, a couple of years ago, the same anxiety that I had when I was going into infectious diseases, thinking that very wise people were telling me that infectious diseases are no longer an important problem. Why are you going into infectious diseases as a discipline? Now that infectious disease is on the radar screen, my concern is that it is almost a fashionable thing now, but it's been here for centuries and it's not gonna go away. So in the closing comment in this uh, article I wrote in Nature Medicine, I said it's imperative that we use the current momentum, and we do have a lot of current momentum to move forward, recognizing the enormous challenges of global health are gonna require a long-term commitment that is sustained even when global health and those fighting to improve it are no longer in the headlines. Because when they leave the headlines, the disease is still gonna be there. Thank you. Are you afraid that the new Congress may try to cut back on NIH funding and scientific funding? Um, yes, that's always um, um, an issue, particularly with the explicit uh, declaration that, that they're gonna cut spending. The NIH budget was the beneficiary of some terrific largesse over many years. We were doubling our budget every 10 years, and then from 1998 to 2003, we, we doubled it in five years. The last seven years, it's been flat. 
So a flat budget for NIH means a 3.2% decrease in purchasing power because biomedical research inflationary index is about 3.2%. So it has been very difficult to get increases, but even people who were talking about containing or reining in spending have been reluctant to cut NIH. So I always, I mean, I'm fundamentally a worrying kind of guy. So I, I'm worried that that's going to happen. I don't think it's going to be draconian. I don't, I mean, they're talking about we want to slash $100 billion um, from the federal budget. Uh, there are still a lot of people in Congress who do want to contain spending but would be quite reluctant to actually cut the NIH. But it certainly is a possibility. Uh, your map of uh, infectious diseases uh, was, was kind of staggering, the number of them. I was just wondering which one keeps you up at night? Um, several of them keep me up at night. Uh, the ones that are wreaking extraordinary havoc that I already know about uh, don't keep me up because of the unexpected, they keep me up because of the expected, namely HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria. I mean, it's just unacceptable that you're talking about those three diseases every year killing, you know, over three million people, close to four million people, particularly people in the developing world who don't have the resources to do anything about it, not to mention even in our own country. The thing that scares me about the unexpected is the whole issue of a rapidly spreading respiratory disease like a pandemic of 1918, which is the reason why I put a lot of effort now with, with the help of a number of administrations to really transform how we address influenza in general. I mean, influenza has become, well, influenza, I have the flu, chew, goodbye, blow your nose, and go, that's not influenza. Influenza is a serious disease. We don't take it very seriously. And again, it's very interesting sociological uh, uh, innuendos here. We, there are about 36,000 people a year die each year. 92% of them are 65 years of age or over. The majority of them are over 80. So unfortunately for our society, people don't pay that much attention to a better vaccine and better drugs. Now that we've had the scare of a pandemic that came but that was relatively mild, what we really need is a universal vaccine that you can vaccinate somebody and protect them against any kind of drifting or shifting flus, new ones that come along, old ones that change. So on the one hand, that keeps me up because I'm afraid it's going to happen, but it also is a big stimulus to me to try and do something about it. What is the relationship between the NIH and other countries in the world that are doing this kind of research? Are there other countries doing any research or work? Uh, yeah, well, when you say the relationship, you mean comparative quantity that's done? I mean, we, we interact with the Pasteur Institute, we interact with the National, the, the, the Medical Research Council in England and in other countries. But if you look at the amount of money that's spent in biomedical research, uh, the, the NIH dwarfs all of the other countries combined. They don't make, they, they implement reasonably well with their health care systems, but they don't do the fund a lot of. I mean, every country has brilliant people who do good research. But if you're talking about quantity alone, the, the, the NIH and the people we fund in our universities is overwhelmingly more than virtually all of the others combined. Yes. Oh. Yeah, Dr. Fossi, according to you, what is the link between cancer and infectious disease? Because we know a few cancers are related to virus. Right. Do you think all of them would be kind of some infectious disease too? No, I, I don't think, uh, I'm, I'm fairly certain. You know, in, in biology, you never say never and you never say always, but I'm pretty certain that not all of the cancers are associated with infectious diseases. There are clear associations 
uh, of some cancers with known infections, hepatitis B and C with hepatocellular carcinoma, HPV with cervical carcinoma, EBV with lymphomas, et cetera, et cetera. I would not be surprised if there would be some cancers over the next few years that are related directly or indirectly to infectious diseases. But cancer is a multigenic, uh, transformative, mutational disease that has a major, major genetic component, either fundamentally the genes that you've been given from your family or the exposure of genetic factors to environmental factors. Some of those environmental factors are infections, but not with every cancer. So we got a few questions. There's one, two, and right here. So why don't you just go right around, right? Can you just comment a little bit on the One World, One Health initiative and whether you think it's important or the importance of it? Uh, you mean with animals and humans? Yeah, yeah, uh, that's a good question. The, 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 the um, uh, program that the, uh, the young ladies are referring to is uh, a program that links diseases uh, and the health of animals with the health of humans. Um, so as opposed to just thinking of ourselves as a species in a vacuum, to realize that there is a relationship. Uh, so let me tell you exactly what that relationship is. I didn't show it, the slide, but of all of the emerging infectious diseases that have occurred, 75% of them are zoonotic. And zoonotic means that they are in, indigenous in an animal and they jump species. And I'll give you a couple of examples for your framework. Influenza is fundamentally a disease of fowl, of birds, of seabirds, seagulls, and ducks, and things like that. HIV was a disease of a non-human primate. SARS was a disease in a bat that jumped into a civet cat that jumped into the humans, and on and on. So about 75% of these diseases are actually related to animals. So there has to be a closer interaction in the scientific community between veterinary medicine and, and human medicine. Right. Okay. You answered oh, I did, okay. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I was wondering what um, you are doing about the incurable diseases we see popping up in hospitals. Infectious diseases? Infectious okay. diseases. I mean, it's just... Yeah, well, we're... That's a good question. What what uh, the question is referring to is, I believe you are, uh, is multiple drug-resistant microbes. And that really relates to one of the slides that I showed. The one that's most commonly recognized is MRSA for methicillin-resistant staph aureus. So there's one thing that you can say about microbes, particularly uh, bacteria and viruses, is that they have such, and that's that little slide I showed you, they have such an extraordinary capability of mutating that even if you practice the best of medicine, they will ultimately mutate and sooner or later become resistant to antibiotics and antivirals at best. Sometimes if you do a good job of not misusing antivirals and antibacteria, it takes a long time or it occurs rarely. Sometimes when you misuse antibiotics, give it under inappropriate circumstances, you can selectively pressure a microbe to become resistant. And that is because of that slide that I showed you that most of the emergence and a drug-resistant microbe is an emerging infection. Most of the emerging microbes occur because of the microbes using its mutational capability to escape something, an encroachment on their environment or the drug. So let me specifically answer your question. There's a disease called Clostridium difficile, C. difficile, which is now a real problem in hospitals, and there's been some outbreaks in nursing homes. There's methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. There's a group of, of, uh, of microbes that are gram-negatives, the Enterobacteriaceae, that we have a very interesting uh, phenomenon that has occurred 
Uh, it's actually occurred in, in, in New York City. It's occurred in Boston. And you may have read in the newspapers about individuals, the, the, the NDM New Delhi, New Delhi metalloproteinase resistance. That doesn't mean anything to you, so you can forget it right now. But what it is is a group of microbes that people got when they went to India to get cosmetic surgery. And they were either infected and got sick or not. They just carried the organism back, came back to the United States, and now it's in some of our hospitals. And it's highly resistant to some of the common antibiotics that would, you would use for gram negative. So these, these microbes are continually probing around of ways to get around what we're trying to do with them. And that's the reason why, in direct answer to your question, what are you doing about it? There are two things. You've got to understand what the genetic basis of why it happens. You've got to implement good hospital sanitation and hospital infectious control measures so that when someone has a resistant microbe, you make sure that you have the kinds of hospital control measures in place. And importantly, and this is one that's not that easy to do, to engage the pharmaceutical companies to make investments to try and develop a new pipeline of drugs because it is not particularly profitable for a pharmaceutical company to develop a new antibiotic. What they want to develop, and if you put them yourself in their shoes, they want to develop a drug that a large number of people will use virtually every day of their lives. Antibiotics, people use them for 10 days, two weeks, and then they stop, and then after a few years, you get resistance. So we, we being the academic community, but more importantly, the federal government, uh, which is what we do at NIH, is make a major investment to try and stimulate the pharmaceutical company to try and develop a new pipeline of antimicrobials. Yes, and then yes. Uh, I was just wondering, um, there's a, a emerging field of ecology and human health. Um, and looking at uh, how NASA has looked at climate models uh, in, and uh, seasonal monsoons in Bangladesh as a predictor of cholera, uh, do you see climate uh, as a potential predictor of other infectious diseases? Um, I've never wanted to get into an argument about global warming or a discussion of global warming because... But I can tell you some medical facts that don't get into that argument. That if you have uh, climate changes of just temperature, you will allow mosquitoes that only really prosper at certain temperatures to expand their range of impact. So an, an example of that is that there are certain parts of Kenya that have malaria. As you go into the highlands where it's cooler, the mosquitoes don't do well and you don't get malaria. Over the past few years, malaria has been seen at progressively higher uh, elevations in places like Kenya. And then there are other things, for example, when you're talking about water and the impact of, particularly in estuaries, that where you have water bringing in uh, different microbes like uh, Vibrio parahemolyticus or things like that. So climate and ecology does have an impact on the range of infectious diseases. Okay, we have one question here and then in the back. Thank you. Uh, can you comment on the new candidates for HIV vaccine or the uh, results from the Thailand trial? Sure. Okay. So the question is referring to a trial that we sponsored with the Department of Defense about a year and a half ago, the results came out of testing an HIV vaccine in Thailand among relatively low-risk heterosexual individuals. And it, we've been testing vaccines now for 23 years. This was the first what we call encouraging modest positive signal, where there was a 31% efficacy among people who were vaccinated compared to the placebo. It's not the end game. It's not ready for prime time, but it did something very important. It did what we call prove a concept, because three, four years ago, if you had asked me, do you think we're going to 
can you guarantee us that we're going to get a vaccine for HIV? I'd say I have no idea whether we're going to get a vaccine because I'm not even sure the human immune system is capable of mounting a response that's protective. We know from this study, as modest as it is, that at least a small percentage of people can be protected. So now all of our efforts are gauged on trying to figure out what it is that that vaccine induced to protect the 31% and try and amplify that to make that a much more effective. Because most vaccines that we all take are anywhere between you know, 85 and 95% effective. 31 doesn't quite cut it yet. In fact. Um, you mentioned the microbicide trial from South Africa. Yes. And you were saying that you were hoping to get some uh, better, uh, good news out of it in the next couple of months. Uh, the last I heard, though. No, no, no. And no, I'm sorry. I, I said we're we're going to be getting results from the pre-exposure prophylaxis study in the next month or so. The trial that was done in South Africa showed a 39 percent efficacy at. Uh, 50 months and a 50% efficacy at 12, excuse me, at 30 months and a 50% efficacy at 12 months. That's really a breakthrough in the sense of a proof of concept. It is unlikely that regulatory authorities would approve that based on that. So there's another trial that's ongoing, the results of which will be available in 2013, also done in South Africa and other countries, comparing oral tenofovir and tricytabine with 1% tenofovir gel. So the proof of concept was that the first time we've ever seen a microbicide give any efficacy, we'll confirm it in a trial that's ongoing but won't be available for results for at least two years. But my actual question, though, was um, the last I heard about the microbicide trials was that they were trying to get another one going, and they were only about 50% to what they needed in way of funding. Do you have any updates on that? Yeah, I do, as a matter of fact. Um, so this, this is inside baseball, so I'll make it quick, because I know you're interested in this, but this is inside baseball. So uh, USAID um, funded the first trial. The South African Medicines Regulation, their equivalent to FDA, is trying to decide whether they need a second trial to confirm it. It was given as a 1% gel 12 hours before sexual intercourse and 12 hours after sexual intercourse. We, together with Gates and others, have a trial that uses 1% tenofovir gel every day, not depending upon whether you have a sexual encounter. The FDA has said they don't need another trial to repeat exactly the same thing of the 1%. The South Africans feel the same way. So the trial that will be the second trial to confirm it is already ongoing and already paid for. So that extra trial that people wanted is not necessary. OK, one more, yeah, or as many more you want. I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about in your experience in the NIH, what the relationship has been between medical advances for treatment and prevention of infectious disease and also other interventions like behavioral modification or other um, things you've seen that are helpful, and so sort of what the balance is for that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, there have been many medical advances. In fact, I, I went quickly. But I showed a slide that had a red circle with all the arrows going out. Those were all the proven preventive measures that a, a medical research study proved that it works. So your question is, what is the balance between the medical research and the actual implementation of it? And the point that I made, and I'll repeat it now for the audience, is that the unfortunate thing is that of all of the known medical proven preventive modalities, only about 20% of the people who could benefit from them either have access to them or are using them. And that's the real problem. Because it is very confounding. And I'll give you a specific example. If you look at um, 
the microbicide study that we were just referring to. If you take all the women in the study, there was a 39% efficacy. There was a direct relationship between whether you used it at every sexual encounter and what your protection was. So when you look at everybody, it's 39%. If you look at the people that used it every single time, it was much, much higher. So we have the modalities, but when it comes to prevention modalities that have to do with sexuality, it is very, very difficult. That's why we tend to distinguish between education and behavioral modification. You can educate someone that if you do this, you will get infected. If you do or don't do this, you won't get infected. And people still keep getting infected. That's the problem.